Are you happy this morning? Excellent. This morning I'm delighted to be able to share God's word with you. And uh, the title of my message this morning uh, is Vision in Three Phrases. Not phases, it's phrases. So vision in three phrases. And I'm going to use uh, a Bible text found in the book of Proverbs, chapter 29, uh, verse 18. A very uh, familiar uh, portion of scripture for all of us. Many of us would have heard, heard about it. Proverbs, chapter 29, 29 uh, verse 18. Um, the Bible reads, it says, Where there is no revelation, the people cast off restraint. Uh, in the older uh, translation, it says, where there is no vision, people perish. Now, this morning, I'm going to attempt to three main phrases that will help uh, make us understand vision a little bit clearer. So those of you who have been attending church uh, for the last few weeks or months would, would be aware that we've been talking a little bit more about our vision. We've been talking about where God is leading us and we've been pretty much staying on the same subject. And I, as I was getting ready to, to preach on this weekend, I really felt the presence from my heart to just stay here. Uh, God really wants to continue to just bring a new revelation to us as a congregation as to why vision is important for us and how we can apply vision into our lives as well. And there's a popular saying that goes like this, and it says, everybody ends up somewhere in life. A few people end up somewhere on purpose. These are the people of vision. So the saying is, everyone ends up somewhere in life, but a few people end up on purpose where they are. In other words, vision is such an essential ingredient for our life that vision is what brings brings feedback. Vision is what brings passion into our life. Vision is what motivates us. Vision is what brings life into mundane activities. You know, it's one thing just to live life and just do things, but when we receive a vision, when we receive a, a, a clear picture of what we want to do, even the ordinary things become special. They become important. Why? Those ordinary things are being worked towards a particular vision. Do you understand what I'm saying? You know, if, if, if you tell someone, hey, I want you to build a wall, and say, okay, just go ahead and build a wall. Every day come and build a wall. And those people who build a wall after the second day, they'll get a little bored, they'll get a little frustrated because they don't know why the wall is being built. They don't understand what is the purpose of the wall. They don't understand the vision behind the wall. But if you told the same group of people and tell them, hey, I want you to build a wall because soon when the monsoon comes, it's going to flood. Awesome. 
possible. And that's why it's so important that as an individual, we constantly challenge ourselves to think bigger, to, to, to aim higher, to be able to see further, to be able to learn more, to grow more. We are constantly challenging ourselves to become a better person. Why? The moment we stop doing that, we begin to slip, slip into mediocrity, and when, when we begin to go into mediocrity, we begin to become unfruitful. That's why I want to challenge us this morning. You are called to dream a big dream. God has a vision for your life. God has a specific vision that He wants to fulfill in and through you. Now, um, here's a few suggestions I want to give you before I jump into what I want to share with you this morning. Um, all of us, at some point in time, and the earlier the better, we need to have a defined vision for our life. If someone was to come up to you and ask you, what is your vision for your life? You, as an individual, must be able to articulate your vision clearly within a sentence. To be able to say, within this period of time, I want to be able to do this, this, and this. All of us need to have a clear picture of what it is that we want to do. You know, I don't think people suggest that it's probably a good idea to write down what it is that you want to do. To write down your vision. To write down your dreams. Because the more you write them down, the more real it becomes to you and it begins to set a mental picture before you that you can begin to pursue. Now the book of Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 2 says, write the vision, write it on plain tablets so that he who sees it may run with it. The Bible says, write down your vision, make it plain, make it understandable so that when you read it, when you see it, you are inspired to be able to run because of that vision and that dream. So having a clear vision gives life meaning. It gives, it gives every small activity purpose. What vision does is it filters all of our activities. Soon what we begin to do, when we begin to live a life of vision, what we begin to do is we begin to not do those things that will help the vision. Do you understand? After a while, you're like, oh, this is not really going to help me to, to do what I want to do, so I'm, not, I'm going to stop doing it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to waste, I'm going to stop wasting my time on the internet because it's not really helping me to do what I want to do. I'm, I'm going to stop wasting my time playing video games because it's not getting me to where I want to go. And that's what vision does. It clarifies our lives so that what we begin to do, it makes meaning to us and helps us to achieve it. Turn to your and say, start writing your vision. Start writing your vision. Because if you have not yet done so, I challenge you to go ahead today. When you get back home, sit down and begin to think hard to yourself. Say, what is it that I want to do? Or if you don't have a clear picture, get on your knees and say, Lord, what is it that you want to do through me? Because God has a vision. God has a purpose. And when we begin to partner with him and then say, God, we want to join hands with you to be able to fulfill that which you've called us to do. All right. Three words or three phrases through which we can define vision. Number one, vision is the ability to see. Vision is the ability to see. Webster in the dictionary uh, defines vision like this and it says, the faculty of sight, that's what vision is. There are a few more advanced definitions as well. And the next definition says, it is unusual foresight. That's what vision is. It is unusual foresight. Another definition is a mental image produced by imagination. A mental image that is produced by our imagination, that's what vision is. And this one, I love this, this definition, it says, the experience of the supernatural as if with the eyes. That was the definition for vision. The experience of the supernatural as if with the eyes. It's like you are seeing things that are not as though they were. How many of you heard that before? Yeah, yeah that's what the Bible says. And that's faith. It's calling those things that are not as though they were. And that's what vision is. You're beginning to see things in your life that are not yet there, but you see it as though they were. And you begin to live your life towards what you want to do and see in your life as well. Vision has this incredible ability to ignore its critics and do things regardless of how impossible people may claim it to be. Now when you become, become uh, uh, just filled with a vision for your life, soon you begin to challenge the status quo. 
you begin to challenge what other people say is not possible, you say, yeah, it's possible. Why? Vision has that ability in us to always challenge status quo. Here's a few examples from history. There's a few interesting guys, and listen to what they said and what happened in, in, in today's time. There's a guy called Thomas Watson, and he was the chairman of IBM, the computer uh, big industry business. In 1943, this guy, Thomas Watson, he said, I think there is a market for maybe five computers in the world. That's what he said, Thomas Watson. There's another guy called Ken Olson, president and founder of Digital Equipment Corporation. And in 1977, he said, there is no reason why anyone would want a computer in their home. Smart guy, isn't he? There's another, another, another memo that was written by the Western Union in 1876, and this, this memo said, the telephone has too many shortcomings to be seriously considered as a means of communication. People actually said this. They said, telephone has got too many shortcomings to actually become a serious mode of communication. And I love this guy. His name is Charles Duell, okay, Charles Duell. He was the commissioner of the US Office of Patents. Everyone would, would submit a patent for the invention. And this guy, Charles Duell, said in 1899, just about the turn of the century, he said, everything that can be invented has been invented. <laughs> 1899, just before the 1900s, he said, everything that has to be invented Wrong. Come on, somebody. That's what vision does. The ability to see, the ability to see beyond the natural, the ability to see beyond the now. That's what vision is. Everyone sees the now, but those with vision always have the ability to see beyond the now and say, I refuse to accept status quo and I see a bigger picture of how to work towards it. That's what Pastor John was talking about last week. Joshua and Caleb, everybody along. Vision is the ability to see. The question is, what do you see today? 
What are you looking at? What are you seeing in your eyes today? What are you seeing? Are you seeing failure, loss, rejection, and an impossibility? Or are you seeing success, triumph, and, and acceptance, and, and, and possibility? Because what you choose to see is what you will do. If you see failure, if you see abandonment, if you see disappointment, if you see impossibility, guess what? You are going to see impossibility in your life. You're going to see failure. You know, I read about, uh, I read about this cool, interesting story about a school kid who came home one day and he brought his report card back to his father. And um, the report card had all poor grades. There was not even one good grade in it. The father looked at him and said, hey, what's wrong with you? Why haven't you scored anything good in your exams? And the kid smartly looked at his father and said, Dad, here's a positive side to it. At least you know I've not been cheating in my exams. <laughs> it's just, you have to choose to see the bright side of everything, right? I don't know if you've ever done that, but that's what vision is. You have to choose to see the God side, the bright side, and say, the world may see it this way, but I, a child of God, will choose to see it God's way. I'm going to choose to see how God wants me to see. And I encourage you this morning to begin to see the divine possibility in every circumstance. See the divine possibility in your job. See the divine possibility in your family. As impossible as the situation may be, look into the divine possibility and say, God, I refuse to accept status quo, and I want to see what you see. Help me see what you're seeing. You know, maybe in the past you, you've had some setbacks and failures. No, maybe in the past you've attended things and it didn't work out. But I want to encourage you to say, don't let those things hinder you from going forward. Use your past setbacks and failures as a foundation for what God is about to do in your life. Use your past setback and make it into a comeback in your life and say, yes, I, I might have failed, but you know what? God is with me, and when he is with me, I will succeed. You know, the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 24, verse 16, it says, For though a righteous man falls seven times, he rises again. Amen. That's what the Bible says. Hey, the righteous, they never quit. They never quit being righteous. Even if they mess up their being righteous, they get up back again and continue to be righteous. They continue to walk forward. That's what you and me as children of God, that's what we're called to do, is to continue to walk. Continue to see the divine possibility in everything. That's the first phrase I wanted to share with you. The second phrase is vision is the ability to believe. Vision is the ability to believe. There's a guy called Steve Goodyear. He was an anthropolog anthropologist. Anthropologist? Yes, that's what he was. An ant. Anth sorry, an anthropologist. My goodness, is not coming in here now. Okay. Anyways, he was a very smart guy. For all those who don't understand. He was a very smart guy. And what he did, he, he conducted an experiment. He conduct, conducted an experiment in a desert, and he took two birds, the vulture and the hummingbird. And he began to study the vulture and the hummingbird. And he concluded and he said, the vulture always goes looking for the dead things. It's always eating and preying on and dwelling on the dead things. And it always stays with the dead. But the hummingbird is quite interesting. Although it roams in the same desert, it does not see the dead things, but it sees beautiful plants. It sees the beautiful things in the desert and it preys on those that are alive, the hummingbird. And he says the difference between the vulture and the hummingbird is the vulture is always on the dead, but the hummingbird is always on the life. So the question this morning to us is what do you see? Do you see death or do you see life? Because what you see is what you're going to live your life by. Because where what you see in people, like for example, if you see bad in people all the time, guess what? People are going to be bad to you. How many of you got that? <laughs> if you look at the bad in people, you're always going to get the bad out of people. But if you choose to look at the good in people, you're going to get the good out of people. It's what you focus on. It's what you begin to believe. Because what you believe in is what is going to happen in your life. That's the truth. That's the Bible. If you took a moment and looked into the, uh, into the book of Hebrews chapter 11, the entire book of Hebrews, that chapter 11, talks about men and women of God who stepped out and 
chose to believe in God despite what their status quo, status quo said was not possible. And they were recorded in the Hall of Fame, the Faith Hall of Fame, because they chose to believe in what God said was possible. What about you this morning? What do you believe in? What is your faith in? Because faith is an important ingredient for a divine vision. Our belief has so much influence in how we live. You know, if you begin your day with a belief that it's going to be a rotten day, guess what? Your day is going to be a rotten day. Even if it was good, it's going to be bad. But if you began your day believing that it's going to be a great day, even though it may be bad, it's going to be a great day. Why? Because you chose to believe in the best. That's what I want to challenge you this morning. If you are to be a person of vision, you got to choose to believe in what God has said is possible. you got to choose to believe God's promises in your life over what the enemy has said. You know, a group of doctors recently conducted an experiment on a group of people. Basically, they picked a group of people, all of whom were suffering with headaches. And they split the group into two. And they asked one group to be in one room and the other group to be in another room. So the doctors went to the first group and they gave them a pill into their hands, all of them, and said, hey, here is a pill that is going to make the headache go away. If you just take this within seconds, your headache's going to go away. Then they went to the second room and they gave another pill that said to that group of people and said, here is a vitamin C for you. You just need to take this vitamin C. We're not sure what it may do to you. It might help with your headache. It may not help with your headache, but we'll see. We'll come back and we'll check. So after a few moments, the doctors came back to the first group and asked them, hey, how, how, is, how is everyone feeling? Almost 75% of the people in the room said, I'm feeling much better. My headache's gone. I'm, I'm perfectly fine. So the doctors went to the second group and said, how are you all feeling? And all of them said, we still have a bad headache. It's not going away. It's still, it's still hurting. Vitamin C doesn't really help. So the doctors brought both the groups together and then told them and said, we gave all of you vitamin C's. <laughs> the first group, we gave you vitamin C. The second group, we gave you vitamin C. But it's what we said to you that made you believe in what was possible. And the doctors, the scientists actually call this the placebo effect. That's actually a medical term that's being used today. It's called the placebo effect, which means what you tell people to believe, they'll believe it. And this is the same with you. What you tell yourself to believe, you're going to believe it. If you believe it's going to be impossible, guess what? It's going to be impossible. Aren't you encouraged? If you believe you're going to fail this year in your semester, hallelujah, guess what? You're going to fail. What do you believe in? What do you believe about your life? Do you believe that you're going to do something of significance in your life? Or you, do, you, do you believe you're going to be like your dad, maybe a drunkard, or waste the rest of your life? Because if that's what you're going to choose to believe, it's going to produce that fruit inside of you. Now the Bible says, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. What you believe, what you think about yourself, that's what is going to produce a result in your life as well. Number three, so the vision is the ability to see, vision is the ability to believe, and thirdly, vision is the ability to do. Vision is the ability to do. <coughs> this is the most difficult part. As long as it is seeing, it's just between us and God. As long as it's believing, it's just between us and God. But when it comes to doing, it's between us and people. And 99 Point nine percent of the times, people will always question your vision. People will always criticize your vision. People will always doubt whether you are the person who is possible, who is able to fulfill that vision. And that's where a lot of people give up. 
But this is the most important part of the vision, is we have to take that step and believe that God will bring everything together in His time. Amen. And I said this before and I say it again, the provision always follows the vision. God does not give you the provision and then give you a vision. He gives you the vision and then asks you to trust Him for provision. That's what he did with Abraham. He comes to Abraham and says, Abraham, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to give you a mighty inheritance. I'm going to make you the most richest man on all the earth. And guess what? It took many years for Abraham to begin to see that vision come to pass in his life. God comes to Moses and says, Moses, I'm going to make you and use you to be the deliverer of my people, children of Israel. And guess what? It took 40 years before Moses could see that vision come to pass in his life. Before Joseph saw that dream as a reality. God always gives the vision and he asks us to trust him for provision. But in the meantime, what he expects of us is to step out in faith and do something. He says, would you trust me? That dream that I've given you, that vision that I've given you, would you trust me enough to know that I will provide for you, that I will sustain you, that I will make it possible? All I'm asking you to do is to step out in faith. David Livingston, the first man to take the gospel to the interior of Africa, he said something like this. He said, I must open a way to the interior or perish. That's what David Livingston said. It was like a do or die for me. He says, I have this vision that I want to take the gospel to the interior of Africa, and unless I do it, I'm going to perish. Hudson Taylor, missionary to China, he said this, I feel as though I cannot live if something is not done for China. <coughs> he said, I can't live unless I do something for the nation of China. <coughs> William Booth, the founder of the Salvation Army, he said this, he said, oh God, what can I say? Souls, souls, souls. My heart hungers for souls. That was William Booth. And all these men, did not just say these things, but they did what they said they were going to do. And because of that, they were remembered today. Because they chose to do something about the vision that God had placed in their heart. A few years ago, they interviewed a man, a German Christian, um, a few years ago. He lived during the Holocaust, during the time when the Jews were being oppressed by Hitler. And this German Christian used to attend a church that was very close to the railway tracks. And as they were interviewing him, the German Christian was saying, as we would begin our service, we would hear the whistle of the train leaving the station. And we would hear the wheels turning, and we would hear the engine chugging, and we would hear the engine come past our church. It was right behind us, the track for, for, the, for the train. And the train would go past us, and as the train would go past us, we would hear the screaming of the Jews. We would hear people screaming, and we knew immediately that they were being taken to their death camps. And every Sunday we would come, and we would know at the exact moment when we would hear the whistle of the train. And our response to that problem was, we decided we were going to sing a little bit louder. When the train would pass us by, we sang our hymns a little louder. And we would hear the screaming, but we would sing even louder. And we would hear every, every Sunday we came together, and we would hear behind us screaming, but we would sing our songs to God a little louder. And the man said, even today, I hear those screams. Even today, I hear the whistle of that train. Even today, I hear that train going on that track. And God, I don't know why we didn't do anything about it. As a church, we chose to ignore it. What a tragedy. There is a proverb that says, all it takes for evil to flourish is for good men to do nothing about it. We live in a day in our generation, and we're living in our end times, and our city and our nation needs God. It needs Jesus. We hear, maybe we're not, we may not hear, we may not be hearing screaming, we may not be able to see that, but yet in the spiritual, there are people who are so tormented, the people who are so far from God, every Sunday we pass them. Every Sunday we walk right past them and we see people who are literally walking to eternal death. And 
who walk right past them. May we not be like that German Christian who said, I wish we had done something. Church, we need to be a people of vision. Not only for ourselves, but for us as a church. We need to have a vision and say, we want to see this city of Palm to a reach. We will do everything within our power and our resources to do something of significance here in this city to reach and touch it. I challenge you. God has a vision for you. God has a plan for you. Don't live your life in ignorance. Don't live your life as though God is not concerned about you. No, my friend, God has a plan. God has a purpose for you. For you. You may say, who am I? I'm just a student. I'm just here for a few years and I'm gone. But could it be that you might be that student that God is looking for? That student who can bring about transformation in that college that you're in? Maybe you're saying, I just, I'm new here. I just moved to the city. I don't know Paul Mitchell very well. I'm just new in this company. Could it be that God brought you here to the city for a purpose? For significance in his plan and his purpose? For a moment, stop today and think. Think beyond yourself and think, God, you have a purpose for me. And may we all have that same attitude that comes to God and say, God, in our lifetime, we don't want to be a people without vision. We don't want to be a people without purpose. We want to be a people of great purpose. We want to be a people of divine vision. We want to see the possibility of the kingdom of God in our city. Amen. Church, I encourage you. You know, we're talking about the vision. We're talking about how we're going to go to the new land. All that is for one reason. We want to see the city touch. We want to see the city of Columbus War come to Jesus Christ. The millions of people that we walk past during a week, may they come to the city of grace of our Father. May they understand the power of Jesus Christ and the incredible love that God showed on the cross for us. May it not end with us, but may we be channels through which God speaks to everyone in our city. Would you stand with me here this morning, church? I want to pray with you. And I really believe that this is something that God placed in my heart tonight. I really hope that the Spirit of God is, is nudging you, is challenging you this morning because that's what I'm hoping for. Because that's His heart. His heart is for His children to partner with Him for His, his vision and His purpose. Maybe you have, you have not pursued the purpose of God, the vision of God, but today, this morning, right now, you can come to me and say, God, I want to align myself to your purpose. I want to align myself to your vision. Today, you can be that Noah who did something extraordinary. You could be that Abraham that stood out in faith and believed in the impossible. You could be that Caleb who at his old age said, yes, it's still possible. I may be old, but God is still with me. You could be that Mary who said, be it unto me according to your word. You could be that Apostle Paul that says, yes, with all my breath, with everything I have, I'm going to take this gospel to every person. Friend, would you respond to his call this morning? Would you respond to him? He's still looking for people who would carry his heart, his mind, his vision. No one else in this world better than us, the children of God, to carry the heart of the Father. May we carry his heart into our workplaces. May we carry his heart into our schools. May we carry his heart into our colleges. May the city of Coimbatore know the heart of the Father. How much he loves us. How much he yearns for us. How much he cares about every single person here in this city. And how much he wants every one of them to know about him. Let me act close to me and bow down all over this place. Before I make a common prayer, I want to ask this question as well. Friend, if you're here, you've never responded to Jesus Christ, I want to give you an opportunity this morning to respond to Jesus Christ. 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ came to earth. He was God, but yet became man. He lived like us. The Bible says that Jesus went to the cross. And he was nailed on the cross. He died on the cross. Why? Why did he do that? He did it for you. He did it for me. What was he going to do with that dying on the cross? Through the death on the cross, Jesus opened the way to God the Father. 
The Bible says anyone who believes with their heart and confesses with their mouth can be saved. And this morning, if you've never accepted Christ and, and you've never accepted the forgiveness of God in your life today, you can receive the forgiveness of God. And guess what? When you receive the forgiveness of God, it's like a weight that's removed off your heart. It's like this burden that's been removed. And there's no greater joy, there's no greater freedom than when God forgives our sin because only He can forgive our sins. If you're here this morning and if you've never asked God to forgive you, if you've never asked God, Jesus, to come into your life today morning, you can invite Him. With every eye closed, every head bowed down, and if you're here and you say, yes, that's me. I would like to open my life for Jesus to come in. I want His forgiveness. Wherever you are, lift up your hand. I want to pray with you this morning. He will come into your life this morning. He will start afresh in your life. Thank you, Mr. Hand. Thank you, Mr. Hand. Thank you, Mr. Hand. Everybody else, wherever you are, quickly lift your hand. Thank you, my friend, Mr. Hand as well. Wherever you are. In just a moment, I'm going to pray, but I'm just going to give you one more second. If anyone else is here, just lift up your right hand quickly, just so that I know that you're here and you're making that commitment. I want to pray with you in just a moment. Thank you, Jesus. Those of you who lift up your hand, I'm going to pray right now. And I want you to listen carefully to my prayer and agree with me as I pray. And I believe as you do that, something amazing, something powerful is going to take place here this morning right now. Pray with me. Father, I thank you for those wonderful friends who have lifted up their hand as a response to you. Jesus, you are our Savior. And today, as they invite you into their life, I pray that you will come into their life. And as they confess their sins to you and their need for you, forgive them. Cleanse them. Let them have a brand new start here, right now, this morning. Let there be a brand new chapter begun in their life. May they begin a journey of discovering who you are and the plans that you have for their life. Reveal it to them, I pray. Bless them and continue to show your wonderful plans to their life. And I pray for us as a church this morning. I've shared with us the need of why we need to be people of vision, why we need to see, why we need to believe, and why we need to do. And I pray that each one of us will take what we've heard to our hearts and in order that we will not just hear it, but we will do something about it. And I pray that you will challenge and you will, you will encourage every one of us in some way this week to step out into that divine vision that you have for our life. Bless your people this morning and just be with them. We love you this morning for you're so wonderful. In the wonderful name of Jesus we pray. Everybody said, Amen. Amen. Can you give God a good hand of praise for you?